If I mention rye, chances are you think of bread or whiskey. Because rye was so indestructible, it became a very important staple of the 18th century. Let's experience rye the 18th century way. I'm making a classic Madeira onion soup, periwinkles, beef tongue in caper sauce, and Pennsylvania Dutch dumplings. Pull up your chair and join me for a taste of history. Isn't this a beautiful bundle of rye? We'll get back later to that. Now let's start concentrating on the first course, which is my Madeira onion soup. To make a superb onion soup, you need a great stock. To make a great stock, you want to buy beef neck bones or any kind of beef bones you can find, readily available in every supermarket. You want to take them, put them into water, take a, an onion, some carrot, a little bit of leek, onion carrot leek, throw it right in there, add a little bit of celery root, celery root goes right in it, there we go, and all you want to do, make this obviously ahead of time. The recipe today is a long one and there is overnight preparation required. I recommend if you want to do that, the beef tongue, which is the main course, takes quite a long time to cook. All you want to do with this, you make an onion pique, which is basically nothing more than an onion, a bay leaf inserted into it, and some cloves. And the cloves are basically the nail that hold the, the bay leaf shut, as their French name means clove for nail. Now, some tongue, you might buy it, and it's already pickled. If the pickled tongue, you don't want to add any salt to it. And in the water it goes. As I said, if the tongue is pickled, no salt. If it's an unpickled tongue, then you have to put salt into the water. Otherwise, it's too plain. French onion soup is a very, very, very simple preparation. However, the trick under this, like I said earlier, the stock. So a good beef stock will do it. All you need is onion. You want to slice it down. Ideally, just a long slice, like so. Onion soup is an all-time favorite. Matter of fact, this recipe, Thomas Jefferson copied by hand and brought it back to Monticello. You want to make sure that you have a hot pan, start with butter. I would not use oil or any kind of shortening on it. Butter would be the thing to do. And just put the onion in your pot. You basically let the onions, whatever we call in technical terms, caramelize, which means you cook the water out of it and get the sweetness coming out. The onion soup, all I did is reduce it down, add a little stock into it, and voila. What makes it so different in the 18th century versus we do onion soup today is that in the end, just now, before I serve it up, I take egg yolks and rainwater Madeira. So all I'm going to do is what we call that a liaison. You see me cooking it many times with cream, but in this particular recipe, we use just an egg yolk. Take a fork and beat it up really good. And what this does, it's going to give a little bit of a velvety texture into the soup. You want to fold it under your soup, but you want to be careful. And also, you don't want to put the soup back on the fire because you don't want to get scrambled eggs. Just like so. All I got to do now is check on salt. And this particular dish gets a good amount of pepper. When you think of French onion soup, most of the time, you think about it being overbaked with a crouton, absolutely right, but like some of our early 18th century compadres like uh, Tali Madison, who maybe didn't have a proper way to overglaze it, she, just, she served a cheese straw on the side. Let me check this quick here. Oh, spectacular. The sweetness of the Madeira and the onion just complements itself. Beautiful.
Linda Swally is a working 18th century farm outside of Philadelphia in Lancaster County. While we always concentrate on city life, let's see what farm life was all about in the 18th century. Colonial America has given um, modern Americans, you know, a wonderful, rich culture, culinary, uh, many other uh, influences, and uh, the roots can be found in great outdoor living history museums uh, like Lands Valley. Childhood memories. In our days, we take so many things for granted. Rye flour being one. You go to the store, that sits beautiful on the shelf. But in the 18th century, and many of the recipes I use, rye flour took a lot of work. Not only to seed it, but the harvesting itself. But harvesting in the 18th century was usually a community event. You'll never look at a loaf of bread the same way uh, after you've spent a day cutting uh, rye or wheat in an 18th century fashion out in a field like here. Uh, you really uh, you know, look at your food much differently. You realize how precious every little grain was. I got a beautiful bowl of fresh periwinkles. Very important is they gotta be fresh and alive. Can you find them? Real easy, most all Asian stores have it because still very much a specialty or a very unique item in the Asian community. Just wanna wash them really good, like I just did. And then there's many recipes. I'm sure there are as many recipes for periwinkles out there for Escargo, which by the way, the periwinkle is a sea snail. That came to this country, they say, nobody knows for sure, on the bottom of the ships from Europe, but that's not certain. Uh, now they're readily available. They're tedious to eat, but really good flavor. So what I do, I have a, I have a, a dutchie, hot, really hot, and I want to do, put the, put the periwinkles in really quick. I have my pot, garlic, onion. White wine, salt, and on the fire they go. And they're gonna cook in no time. You wanna have it pretty hot. So now I'm just gonna put the lid on it, let it steam for a while, and then later I'm gonna add heavy cream and the herbs into it, check for salt and pepper, and the dish is ready. Still today served in many of the French restaurants throughout this country, or the world for that matter. It's delicious eating, a little tedious of eating because they're kind of small, but it makes them so much more fun. All right, the periwinkles are done. Oh, beautiful. You can just uh, get a flavor of the ocean. I have some chives already chopped, a little bit of parsley chopped, and all I want to put is some heavy cream into it. You don't really have to, by the way. Oh, yeah. Heavy cream just puts a little bit more flavor into it. Beautiful. As I mentioned earlier, it's not an easy dish to eat, but it makes for great conversation and company. You normally have a, a, a little fork with a, a small prawn, or you can just use, like I'm using today, one of those bamboo picks. And you go inside and you get the snail out. Mm, unbelievable. The flavor. The garlic, the onion, the cream, it's un unbelievable. Now, the only thing would be different if I want to have a little bit of extra flavor, I would in, put in my 20-year-old uh, ketchup that the, the sailors would use, and it would put an additional, an additional flavor to it. Beautiful. It's almost like a fish sauce, as you know it. Let me see here. Oh. 
beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So simple, so easy, but so much 18th century. Taste of history, we concentrate on the aristocrats of the 18th century. Let's check out the common folks. Good day, Carrie. Good day, Walter. I'm told this is the place to come for some fantastic baked goods. So show me what you got here. <laughs> well, we're making bread. The way we do it in the 18th century is very much by feel, starter, a little additional water if necessary, salt, and just the flour. Nothing has changed much between the 18th century and today. To make a real good rye bread or any kind of bread, you still need a good mother or starter, as you call it. Mother, yes. Yeah. It's just flour and water, and it attracts oh. the, the natural yeast and the and the air and the humidity is is moving it along quickly. There's no additional yeast. It's a natural fermentation that yes. takes place, which is what makes it also so good and so beautiful. So flavorful. <laughs> yeah. So, Carrie, I'm soaking wet already from you just making a little breakfast. Certainly, in the winter, having the heat inside is is very necessary. But in the summertime, uh, to bake a large amount of bread and maybe baking once or twice a week. Uh, the bake oven is, is in a separate building outside and it keeps all the heat outside. And I know you already have some in the oven. We have some bread, would you like to go see? Absolutely. Got it? Oh, it looks good. Oh, it is tough to explain, huh? <laughs> it is. Something about it, fresh baked, uh, no preservatives, no additives, 18th century is its finest, I'm telling you. And just smell it, it's just gorgeous. And the crust on these yeah. should be really good. Too. That here, yeah. that's what's got to be. Yeah. That one was the whole wheat. Uh -huh. And that? That one's the whole wheat and rye. Oh, right. it just came off the rye fields, mm -hmm. perfect. <laughs> I hope you have a knife handy because I'm not leaving without tasting a piece of this bread. I have a knife right in my pocket, we can go cut a slice right now. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, the tongue will take an hour, if not more. So the tongue now is ready, so let me go get it. One, one thing to remember, that in the 18th century, tongue was definitely a specialty. As much correspondence as I've seen, tongue has always been kind of like putting a special kind of, special kind of pedestal. This would have been like a very, very small a cow or a steer for this one. The tongue has an outer coating on it, which is actually very firm, almost like a sandpaper. And so don't ever worry about it where the tongue has been, because what you're going to do now, you're going to peel the outer skin of the tongue. I have asbestos uh, hands, so I can take it, but quite frankly, if you let it chill off a little bit, it's easier to peel. The big thing is, if you let it get cold, you must let it get cold in the stock. Because if you take it out of the stock, the skin gets so hard, you will never get it off. You'd have to actually take it off with a paring knife. And then you want to trim down the bottom part of the tongue because, as you know, the tongue goes far down in the neck. Now, this, this is some of the best meat that you can possibly find. Mmm, beautiful. And you have the tongue peeled. And I have one peeled already. Remember, when cooking 18th century style, we reverse the process. So what I'm doing right now, I'm putting some butter in my pan. And it's a hot pan, as you can see. It has to be hot. Butter. I have onions already chopped. And all I'm going to do, I'm going to saute the onions down. The onions for this recipe stays in the sauce. So we're going to simmer them down. They'll sweat down real quickly. I deglaze them with a little bit of white wine. All right. Beef stock is on the fire. I'm going to put the beef stock in there a little bit. While this is doing that, the tongue is still sitting here, cooling off a little bit. I'll chop some of my cremini mushrooms that I use later for the sauce. The reason I use cremini because a little bit more flavor and also the color. I like it better than button mushrooms. Like a real coarse chop. 
The beauty about many 18th century recipes, I don't have to be too fine or finesse, like in French cooking. There's a more rustic ap approach, which is really nice. Here we go. My onion stock should be ready, yes? Two seconds. Look at it, how fast it goes. Heavy cream. Make a little taste test here. Make sure that we have enough flavor in it. Let's see here. Excellent. Right Mushrooms. Right in the sauce. Cook down a little bit more. While it cooks down, I'm going to slice the, the tongue. Perfect. So the tongue we slice. The end is always for the chef. So the way we do that is we have one tongue in the middle and the other tongue we lay around. Go over here. As you can see, look how nice and lean the meat is. That's for the beauty of the tongue. Much appreciated. Now the sauce is reducing down. All I got to do is bring it over. In 18th century cooking, we work the reverse project. The Burmanier goes in it. Bourmanier, which means uh, flour, hand butter, equal parts. So if you have two spoons of flour, you take two spoons of butter, you mix it together. The heat of the Dutchy, the Dutch oven, is so intense that it actually literally does the binding right over here. You don't have to worry about it. So all you want to do is mix it up as you see me doing it. You can put it on the fire for a quick second if you, if you like to, like I'm going to do right now, just to make sure. But basically the flour and... and uh, Butter mixture will completely cook out, so it's not an issue. We put it back on the fire for a little bit. My sauce is almost ready completed. It doesn't surprise me that Jefferson and many other of his uh, 18th century compadres consider tongue something very special. Matter of fact, we know for a fact that Ed Lamea, his uh, maitre d' and, uh, or maitre domo, would buy tongue many times for him. So tongue was a very often served dish in Monticello. I'm going to capers into the sauce. Now I'm going to put some heavy cream. Mind you, as you can see many times in cooking 18th century, heavy cream is used a lot. The reason for that is because it's nothing better. The flavor of heavy cream is just spectacular. I'm ready to serve up the tongue. All I got to do is ladle the sauce over the tongue. of my parsley, a little bit of chives, and for this particular dish, maybe just a nice speck of parsley on the side, make it look very elegant. As you know, the man I admire most in the 18th century is Thomas Jefferson. Matter of fact, this recipe would have been served many a times in Monticello, as we know from researching his transcripts. There was a time during Jefferson's presidency when Americans had to give up coffee for the good of the country. We've just been cooking in Charles Thompson's kitchen and how fortunate I am to actually find him here at his lovely estate. It's been a pleasure. Welcome, sir, welcome. And your kitchen is superb, Oh, thank way. you so much. It yes. matches my food. <laughs> <laughs> in 1807, America was on the brink of war with Britain. President Jefferson convinced Congress that instead of getting into a war America was unprepared to fight, it should instead impose an embargo on all foreign trade as punishment. One of the banned products Americans would no longer be able to import was the newly prized coffee bean, which was replacing tea as the hot beverage of choice. Born of necessity and Yankee ingenuity, an interesting substitute was found. As you can attest, your good friend, uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, when he instituted the embargo, none of the ships could come ashore, so henceforth coffee also didn't make it, and by then already everybody was crazy about coffee. Coffee houses were all over, as you know, of course. not just in London, but here in, in the colonies. The people had to look for something else, and what was the else? It was the rye coffee. Rye is a great alternative to coffee, but it has one thing it's lacking, and of course that is the ability to make one talk and to think and to jabber in the coffee house traditions. And people start talking, and pretty soon they're talking about one thing, 
And that's the king. Mm -hmm. He didn't like that in England, you know. He closed all the coffee houses. So I understand, yes. yes. What's interesting is that you take the rye flakes and really what you're going to do, very slowly roast them. Indeed. And the flavor, when you roast it slowly, comes, it's, it's, it's equal to coffee. You just brew it like you brew regular coffee. The difference only is, like you said, no caffeine. No caffeine. Well, I, I drink to that, sir. Isn't that, huh? <laughs> it's just lovely. Yeah, here yeah, to coffee. Mm -hmm. To complete our spectacular meal today, in honor of Thomas Jefferson, and why, for that matter, we're going to do some quick dumplings. It is perfect with the tongue, and it's just a perfect dish to eat. So what you do is you make a straightforward pasta dough, and you're going to roll it out. Now the trick is how thin you want to make it. Now, this is not a noodle, it's a dumpling. So a dumpling is not necessarily as thin as a noodle, so you can make it smaller, tighter, whatever you want to make. You can even take it right off the dough, like we call it a zupfteig, which is kind of interesting. They still do this in Pennsylvania, Dutch country, where you take it and you literally pull it, the dough right off and put it in the boiling water. I'm going to cut them in. You make it really, really small, and then you add it into the boiling water. And once they're flowed up, they're going to take a while because they're actually nice and large. You put them on the platter, and you're ready to eat. I got to make sure is I got to pull them off here, one by one. Watch me. Once they boil, they're done. The water all has a little bit of oil in it, some salt. This particular dumpling many times gets put under chicken and dumpling, many different dishes that we still do today in the Amish country. What's unique about this one here, or what you could be careful about when you make it, you got to taste it to make sure that it's cooked. That's the difference. Go ahead, let me try one. Couple more minutes. I'm done. As I mentioned earlier, the dumplings take some time. I just test them, they're ready, I'm going to serve them up. Now, can you put, uh, you put some on there like butter and stuff like that? Absolutely. Whatever you want to put on the plate, there's no right, no wrong. I just happen to like them just like that. And put a little bit of uh, herbs on it. That's beautiful. Remember, the beef tongue has a lot of flavor with the, the capers and the mushrooms, so it doesn't need any more additional flavor into it. Here we go. All I got to do now... Look at this, this is gorgeous. Almost looks like a gnocchi, but it's not. A little parsley in over it. A little bit of chives. Taste for the chef. That's just gorgeous. The dumplings I just made, it's a perfect partner to the tongue we made earlier with the caber and cremini mushroom sauce. It's great together, you ought to try it.